G'day everybody, Damien Patterson here from Integrity Property Education. If you're looking for property investment advice, property investment strategies and basic property investment knowledge, you've come to the right place. Today's blog video is about negative gearing and the proposed changes to negative gearing. Well, what is negative gearing first and foremost? It all depends on what context you're talking about. Now, if we're talking about government policy, we say negative gearing. But really what they should be saying is just gearing. Now, there are positively geared properties and there are negatively geared properties. What does that actually mean? Well, what it means is that the government allows us to claim any losses associated with an investment property on our tax and then reduce our taxable income and get a tax return. So how does it work? Well, quite simply, your rent that you receive from your investment property is added to your income, and then all of the expenses associated with that property then get deducted. So the interest on the loan, the insurances, the maintenance costs, rental management, um, and all those other things, depreciation, then reduce your income down, and then more often than not, especially when you add depreciation, you'll end up on paper looking like you've made a loss. And therefore, you'll be able to claim that loss on tax and get whatever tax bracket you're in, 32 and a half, 37 and a half back on tax. So that's what negative gearing is in concept. Now, why do we have negative gearing? Well, have you ever stopped to think about who owns all the rental properties? Now, the banks will only lend money to people who have enough money to save a deposit. And so therefore, not everyone can afford to buy their own home. So we must have rental properties available for the population who can't afford to buy their own home. Now, there's two ways we can do that. One is we can have government housing, which has proven to be a very um, you know, negative way of providing housing. And then the other option is to encourage investors to buy houses and make them available as rentals. So this is what negative gearing policy is really all about. It's about encouraging Australians to own investment properties so that there are rental properties available for those who can't buy their own. So what are the changes that they're proposing with negative gearing at the moment? Well, depending on which way you look at it, some people see negative gearing as a massive impost on the Australian budget, with billions and billions of dollars being refunded to, to property investors every year to say uh, thanks for having investment properties. Some people see that as a bad thing, but the wiser people actually see it as a good thing because without those investors, the government would have to provide that housing anyway, and then we'd be spending money on government housing rather than on tax returns. So, why not do it? And my personal view is it's not broken, so don't try and fix it. However, it continues to come up as a political hot topic. Now there's two statistics you need to know about the chances of any legislation getting changed. And they are that 18% of Australian taxpayers now own an investment property. So making any changes to um, negative gearing policy could potentially be electoral suicide and they'll be very hesitant to do so. The second statistic that's relevant is that 55% of members of parliament own investment properties. So those two factors are quite relevant. Um, if you do bring in such a policy, the, you may face an electoral backlash. And if you are going to try and get it through, you've still got to convince all the members of parliament to pass the bill itself. So before any change could go through, those two obstacles would need to be changed. Now, what policy though are they proposing? Well, the Labor Party recently came out with a policy which they're using a bit of a thin edge of the wedge strategy. And the first thing they're saying is that they're going to grandfather any existing arrangements for negative gearing. So if you already have a property and you're claiming negative gearing benefits, they won't take that away from you. But what they're also saying though is going forward into the future, they're only going to allow negative gearing on properties that are purchased brand new. The theory behind that being that we want to build more houses so that our growing population has got somewhere to live. So that sounds good in theory and it sounds like it will beat 
these two statistics, which is the net the voter backlash and trying to get it through Parliament, because both the voters and the members of Parliament won't be affected by a policy change if it's grandfathered. So that's an important point to note. But let's just talk about basic economics now and what effect that will have on the property market. Now, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to talk about old houses. Now, old houses at the moment, 25% of buyers are investors and 75% are owner occupiers. So once this policy comes in, we're going to see a reduction in buyers for existing homes. Now, basic supply and demand economics says that if you have a reduction in supply or an increase in demand, you will have an upward pressure on prices. If you have an increase in supply or a reduction in demand, you'll have downward pressure on prices. So if we take away negative gearing from older properties, investors are going to stop buying older properties or we're going to see a significant reduction in those who do. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that older suburbs are not going to see as much price growth. There's going to be a 20, you know, 25 percent of buyers are now no longer going to be there, or um, significantly reduced percentage are going to be investors, and therefore there's going to be less demand for those properties, and prices will go down in theory. So, what, but another thing that's quite interesting as well is that in older suburbs, there's then going to be less and less properties available for rent. Now, that is a reduction in supply of rental properties. What does that mean? That means the cost of renting in older suburbs, in particular in the city suburbs, is going to go up. So, if we bring in this policy with grandfathering, we're going to see downward pressure on prices in older suburbs and upward pressure on rents. Now that may not be a good thing for a government who's trying to get elected. If we're going to have voters losing value on their homes and we're going to have renters paying more rent, that is potentially uh, electoral suicide as well. Now let's talk about the new market. Now if they're going to bring it in only for the new market, what effect is that going to have on new suburbs? Well, first of all, all the investors are going to shift their buying power to new estates. What does that mean? That means that we're going to see a dramatic increase in the amount of properties in new estates that are for investment versus the amount of properties that are for owner occupiers. That will mean that there's more renters in a suburb and it will mean rents will drop in those newer suburbs because there'll be, sorry, there'll be more rental properties in those suburbs, so there'll be an oversupply of rental properties. Now most new suburbs are on the outskirts of town as well and a lot of renters who need public transport won't be able to live there because new suburbs generally have very poor public transport infrastructure. So what we're going to see there is a drop in rents in the new suburbs. But what we'll also see is an increase in prices in new suburbs because we're going to have lots more investors going in there. So what does that mean? <coughs> Older suburbs, prices are going to come down, rents are going to go up. Newer suburbs, prices are going to go up, rents are going to come down. Interesting, isn't it, how that works? Either way, I don't think anyone's going to be happy about it. So, will this policy come in? I highly doubt that they're going to change the policy. But if you're already an investor and they do bring in the policy, don't fear, because it's not going to have a big effect on your current situation from a cash flow perspective because you know, if you've got existing properties, rents are going to go up, that's good for you. They're going to grandfather the policy so you retain your tax benefits. Uh, if you're a new investor looking into stuff, well then it's going to be great for capital growth because prices in new areas are going to go up. So you're going to make good initial capital growth while those areas are being deli uh, delivered and there's lots of demand. But perhaps your cash flow won't be so great when the rents don't take off like we would hope to. So, that's negative gearing. A long blog video today, but a very complex issue that people need to understand. If you like this blog video, please share it with your friends. If you learn something, share it, because there's a lot of people out there who've got no idea what they're talking about when it comes to negative gearing, and I really would like you to get out there and educate people, and there's the quickest way to do that is probably just to share this video. So. That's it for me today. If you've got any more blog videos, uh, questions that you want answered, just comment on the, on the post below and in our next round of videos, I'll be happy to, to throw them out there and uh, give you some answers. Don't forget if you're, uh, to like our Facebook page, Property Investment Mentors, follow us on YouTube, subscribe to us on YouTube, and you can also find us on Twitter and you can find us on LinkedIn. That's it. Until next time, cheers.